I'm not going to lie. This heal us now is, is, I'm so, I'm yearning for that. This divided nation and people and Jewish community, I am so deeply yearning for this heal us now moment. And when we say healing of body, of soul, for all of these folks that are important to us, I take that to heart. And we know that there are folks in our community and beyond our community and into your communities who are in the midst of struggle. But our country, too, is in the midst of all of these kinds of struggles. A healing of our people and land, race and nation, child, every woman, every man. So that wasn't how I was intending to start, but that's where I am. And I've been thinking a lot about it over these last few days and after different news and challenges and women's health concerns and what does Taurus have to say about issues of, cons of concern and of life and of death and when does life begin? These are all such personal and complicated questions. And I can tell you what I think. I can tell you what the Torah says. And some of you will listen, and some of you will say, oh, I didn't know that. And others are going to say, I don't really care. Because I have, I'm fixed. I'm, I'm set in my position. But I think we have to care about where each other sits and how we can listen to folks who disagree with us. And then we get into a political arena. And this isn't about politics, but it is about values. And how, I know, me too. <laughs> how do we respond to questions of faith and when faiths disagree? How do we respond to it? So the first thing I thought of was when I was a kid, really, uh, I was actually I was a college student, and I was on the staff for the Reform Movement's youth movement for NIFTI, the North American Federation of Temple Youth. Lots of Reform synagogues have kids that are going to, to NIFTI retreats and events uh, for us. It's this Missouri Valley region, which is ridiculous because it covers 14 states. But in NIFTI, I, there was a mentor for me. His name was Al Vorspan, who died just a few months ago. And, and Al Vorspan was somebody who, who was close with Dr. King and was a champion for civil rights. And he said to all of these kids, and I was in college working this nifty national convention, and Al Vorspan said to all of these kids, you have to be a nutnik for decency. And I was the only one on my table who knew what nutnik was, because my mother called it to me all the time. <laughs> How do you translate nutnik? Pest? No, that's not nice. It's like that, but it's nicer. It's a cute pest. Okay, let's go with that. So you have to be a nudnik. You have to keep going, keep pestering. All right, maybe it works. For decency. And he said you have to be a catalyst for social justice. And I remember this man preaching. He said the insistence of Reformed Judaism is to be a part of the world. And in that act of sharing, the only way to, for people to understand your pain, you must understand other people's pain. And then he said, right after that, a woman's rights are not negotiable. And it stayed with me all of these years. So we can have thoughtful conversations about issues about choice and life and abortion. And in Jewish tradition, there is a clear consensus. It's not just reform. It's all throughout the Jewish community that life doesn't begin at conception. But that doesn't mean that this existence that's before birth doesn't have value. So how do we balance all of these different really complicated questions? How do we balance that in the polarized country, community, synagogue. How do we have the conversation? I was wondering how to share this with you. Why is it that most of, not all, but most of the American Jewish community, whether you're on 
the liberal side of the spectrum or conservative side of the spectrum, most in the American Jewish community are pro-choice. That doesn't tell you what decisions that they would make as individual women. But when it comes to public policy and how do we engage the world, it's a pro-choice community by and large, the overwhelming majority, close to 90%. Why is that? Well, I think in the Jewish community we have an appreciation traditionally for something called a machloket. A machloket is a difference of opinion, that we can argue with one another and still come together at the same table. We're starting to lose that though. But that is inherent in Jewish values and tradition, is being able to argue and discuss and still enjoy each other's company. We don't even have to avoid the topics. Today we're avoiding the topics. Can't go to Thanksgiving dinner and talk about something of substance because somebody's going to walk out. Ah, oh, what a shame. So we value machloket, but we also value this idea of a separation of church and state. We have an appreciation, since we've been a minority all along and still are, and that's not going to change anytime soon. The separation of church and state means that we're not going to have other people legislate their religious values onto us. And sometimes that's a little bit painful. And it's one of the things that America's Jews really truly celebrates all together is the separation of church and state. Okay, so that could be another idea. So we still don't know how one another feels about it, and people feel differently about it, and I'm going to say that that's okay. But if we're going to take Al Vorspan's words, or at least I am, and talk about being a nudnik for decency and understanding people's pain, I don't have memories of what it was like when abortion wasn't accessible for women, but my mother, had memories, and she told me stories that were so sad, because whether it's legal or not, it's going to happen. So how do we have safety, health care, reproductive health care for all, for women? And I think there is a value that the Jewish community has to respond to, regardless of what one's individual perspectives, religious intimate perspectives are going to be. That's why the overwhelming majority of the Jewish community is going to lobby for pro-choice issues when it comes to Capitol Hill. You know, in May of 1967, there was an organization that was founded among clergy, many rabbis and other mainline Protestant pastors. It was called the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion. It became this international network of clergy, of clergy who recognized that there was an issue that was going on and women's lives were in danger. And they made sure that women would have access to legal and illegal abortions from licensed medical professionals. Licensed medical prof professionals. Today that organization is called the Religious Coalition on Reproductive Choice. And it covers the spectrum of people of faith. They bring people together to show that there's not one faith that should legislate our religious values. And I'm going to talk to all people about how difficult it is to make these decisions and what might be at stake for all of us. But it's going to be what's at stake for these women. So some of you are going to say, well, what does this another white man have to do with talking about all of this? Well, I'm going to say that when people's lives are at risk, we step forward and be a nutnik for decency and to make sure that reproductive health care is part of health care, and to advocate religiously, because we might be a minority, but we have an important voice, and we speak for others, and you don't have to agree with me, and we can talk about that. <laughs> I'm expecting it, actually. That's okay. We can do that here, because if we are in this relationship, well then, shouldn't we be able to talk about it? You know, there is, I want to share this other story. It was actually on a blog by a, a, a very popular Jewish Israeli blogger. Her name is Sarah Tuttle Singer. 
And some years ago, she wrote about her own personal experience. It was, it's kind of provocative blog, and it was on Kveller. Kveller is in the same category as Nudnik, in case you don't know. To Kvel is like to be proud over like your kids kind of a thing. Um, so this, this like Jewish parenting blog website called Kveller, well, she begins her story as a 19-year-old student at UC Berkeley, and she's terrified outside of the social worker's office. Uh, and she writes about discovering that she's pregnant and thinking to herself, nice Jewish girls don't get knocked up freshman year of college. That's what she's writing about. It was kind of harsh, and she was really insecure about it. And she says that the social worker was nothing but kind and gracious to her. And she had this uh, exchange with the social worker, and, and this other woman was saying things like, these things happen, and it's my job to make sure that you have all of the resources that you can make your decision. OK. They get to a conversation recognizing that Sarah has insurance as, as, as a college student, the school's insurance. And she's relieved that she has it, but she still needs to come up with $250. And at the time, for her, that was just an extraordinary amount of money. She didn't know how she could do it. She didn't want to go to her parents, because she felt like they would be so devastated and ashamed and hurt. Because this doesn't happen to girls like her was her message inside. So this is Sarah's voice. She said, I gulped. It's actually quite reasonable, she said, the social worker, when she saw my baleful expression. I had no idea what, what the going rate was, but $250 seemed like a staggering figure. I barely had enough extra cash to cover the month. At the moment, I had a grand total of $12.97 to tide me over, and I knew my asking my parents for money would break their hearts. Hypothetically speaking, what if someone doesn't have enough money, I asked, and the social, social worker looked at her, and she saw um, a Jewish star around her neck. And she, the counselor asked her, are you Jewish? So Sarah, of course, is a little bit taken back. Like, what does this have to do with it? She, I'm going to be on my guard now. She writes in the blog that her face flushed. She looked down at her shaking hands. She thought to herself, I taught Hebrew school at my synagogue. I received the rabbi scholarship for outstanding work in the Jewish community. I kept kosher, and now I'm 19 and pregnant. But this proud young Jewish woman told the counselor that indeed she was Jewish. And the counselor responded, OK, because there is a Jewish women's group that offers a scholarship of $250 to help cover costs like this. Would you be interested in that sort of thing? Now, the thing that shook the blogger, Sarah Tuttle Singer, isn't that she was able to receive the money. She writes with some colorful language that I'm not so comfortable to say from the Bema, that she was comforted not about the financial support, but because they were Jewish women, Jewish women who recognized that Sarah was not the first, nor was she going to be the last, Jewish woman who needed to make a difficult decision like this, and where money shouldn't be a factor in taking care of herself, where money shouldn't have to be a factor in order to get appropriate care. So the last thing I want to share with you is a couple of points from the Women's Rabbinic Network, which comes from the Reform Movement. Among their seven points, here's just a few. We believe every woman has a right to choose what happens to her body. We also value human life and its potential. The second one is we trust women. The ability God gave to women to carry potential life comes with power and responsibility, and we trust women to carry out the blessings and questions that come with this extraordinary capacity. While not every woman is able to or chooses to have children, it is nonetheless certain that legislation which diminishes women's right to choose thereby questions women's ability to be moral, ethical, loving, and thoughtful about life and its potential. The last one I wanted to share with you out of these seven is, we believe that pro-choice is pro-gender equity. At this moment in time, we must ensure the equal rights of women. After millennia of various forms of subjugation, this moment in time calls upon humanity to affirm the equality of all God's creatures, regardless of gender identity and its presentation. Legislation which limits a woman's right to choose what happens to her body is a continuation of subjugation. Without the ability to control our own bodies, 
Women are not free and not equal. So, what am I trying to say? I think there's still a feeling of being in Mitzrayim and in Egypt, and I still think that there are pharaohs out there, and we need to walk in the footsteps of Miriam and Moses, bring a nourishing well of inspiration and truth to nourish and sustain a people and help them come together in God's presence without exception for any. Can you hear that song?